morning, everyone. It's Sunday morning. We're excited to worship with you guys. Hi, kids. You have your time with Miss Rebecca at 11 a.m. on YouTube. You can continue giving online at internationalbaptistny.org forward slash give. You can also give through the church app. to the Lord 
so gently sustaining Have you not seen all that is needful has been Shaped by his gracious ordaining Praise to the Lord who will prosper Well, happy Sunday morning to you, and uh, what a wonderful time of worship we've enjoyed. Uh, we are really looking forward to the time soon that we can gather together for corporate worship and corporately open the Word of God and, and read it together and study God's Word uh, back on our campus. Well, we've been studying 1 Peter, and uh, 1 Peter is such an appropriate passage uh, for this time. Uh, because Peter's writing to a church that's scattered. He's writing to Christians that are away from anything familiar, and as such, they are suffering. And we've been studying this. Uh, if you haven't been a part of the first few weeks of our study, feel free to look that up on our YouTube page and uh, get caught up. Well, in 1 Peter, uh, today we come to verse 22, and we're going to go into chapter 2. Uh, because uh, today we're looking at this theme, love. Love, not just any love, but love from a pure heart. And uh, what we have found is that uh, we have a lively hope. So Peter's writing to some Christians who, because of their suffering and being scattered, uh, it's, it's going to be harder for them to realize and remember their hope and uh, be grounded in their hope. So Peter says you have a hope, and not just a hope, a lively hope. And he described what that hope is like. Think about this. That hope is incorruptible. That means it never fades away. It never decays. He said that hope is undefiled. That means it can't be soiled. Nothing can detract from it. He said that hope fadeth not away. That means it's perpetual. It's lasting. It, it doesn't dim. And then he said it's reserved in heaven. That means it's, it's safe. It's completely secured, not because of us, but because we are kept. We are kept. It's, it's eternal security of the believer because of the power of God. Uh, uh, not us keeping our salvation, but we are kept in the love of God. We are kept uh, securely, and so it's reserved in heaven. There's nothing that anyone can do, including you, to remove uh, you from that hope or that hope from you. If you put your faith in Christ, if that's true faith, uh, then um, you are. it's reserved in heaven. That hope is reserved in heaven for you. And so this lively hope... And um, what Peter, what we've seen over the first few weeks is that Peter is saying that you have this 
joy and a rejoicing. Not that, hey, you're suffering now and uh, one day you're gonna get back to rejoicing. He is literally saying you are now rejoicing, but even though you're in this season of trial and burden, you are rejoicing in that season of burden. Oh, friend, church family, that is a hope that is a lively hope and that's real for you and for me today. Thank God for that. And so Peter now uh, has begun. He's talking about that hope. Remember your salvation. And then he begins to talk about some things that we can lose when we suffer. Last week we talked about uh, uh, holiness. Uh, as a matter of fact, the last two weeks we talked about holiness. In other words, Peter's saying, just because you're suffering doesn't give you the occasion to lose your holiness. You're suffering. You can't treat those who are responsible for you losing uh, that, uh, you, you know, your peace and your tranquility and being scattered. You can't look at them and and uh, with hearts of hatred and malice and anger, um, he is telling them that uh, they should not lose their holiness. And last week's message, we looked at uh, three reasons why uh, we shouldn't lose that. In the last two weeks, actually, we, we looked at that. And so um, today we come to uh, another tendency. So there's a tendency when we suffer, and that's to lose our holiness. You mistreated me. I'm suffering, so I'm going to mistreat you. Well, there's a second tendency, uh, and uh, that is that when we're persecuted, when we suffer, we tend to take out our frustrations on those closest to us and those that we deem responsible for that suffering. And that appears to have happened in Peter's day also. Human nature has not changed, and so uh, we're not to lose our love. Now, what should define our relationship with other believers <clears throat> is our love for one another. That's what Jesus said. Hey, they're going to know you. They're going to know who you are. They're going to know you belong to me because of your faith. But that faith is going to result in love. And so Jesus said, you know how people around you will know that you belong to Christ because you love one another because of your love. And uh, what a wonderful uh, testimony that is. As a matter of fact, uh, so many people have come to know Christ as their personal savior because a Christian believer exhibited love toward them uh, and reassured them of God's love to them. And so today, let's look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, and uh, I'm going to read the text, and we'll have a word of prayer. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22 says, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. Then in chapter 2, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Um, let's, let's pause for uh, a word of prayer this morning and thank God for his word and ask him to apply it to our lives. Father, we know that we are in a world that is filled with anger and malice and hatred and strife. We also know that we don't lose hope in the midst of that. We have a hope that is alive. It's lively. And so would you use this time together this morning in your word to equip us to be um, the light to the world around us, the light to those around us that are hurting and suffering. They may have malice and anger in their heart and not have any answer for it. Would you 
first equip us and then challenge us through your word to exhibit that love to others and to explain to others why that love is in our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the this love, we uh, first of all, uh, we're going to find out in our text uh, today and next week that um, there are three analogies, if you will, three metaphors that Peter uses under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, three metaphors for the believing community uh, that um, we are instructed to love, three metaphors for our instruction to love. The first one we'll see is family. The second one we'll see is a building. And the third one we'll see is a nation, family, building, and nation. And so Peter uses these analogies, the Holy Spirit does, to demonstrate what kind of love this is to us. So he calls this love an unfeigned love. The word unfeigned is anapocritus, anapocritos, which is uh, sincere. It means this unfeigned, it's sincere love. Uh, we get our translation uh, uh, unhypocritical. This is a true love. It's a genuine love. It's a sincere love. And so um, in verse 24, then he, he talks about um, this unfeigned love. In verse 23, says that the basis for that is we're born again, not of a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. That's how we come to know Christ as our personal Savior. It's through the Word of God. It's, it's uh, that truth of the Word of God, and that Word of God liveth and abideth forever. He says, then in verse 24, he says, for all flesh is grass and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. And he says, here's how that compares. Here's how my glory compares the glory of man and my flesh. The grass withereth and the flower thereof falleth away. And, and so, uh, our flesh will have demise, it, it decays, it will end one day. We, it's appointed unto man once to die, after this the judgment. And so, we, uh, so, so what Peter says here, we love one another because we're members of the same family. Uh, and uh, in verse 24 there that we just read, Peter quotes from Isaiah 40. Now, Keep in mind that the chapter divisions that we have in our Bible aren't inspired by the Holy Spirit. These, uh, the words of, of God are inspired by the Holy Spirit. The chapter vision, divisions are simply for our help. Uh, and they were inserted about 800 years ago. And uh, so the thought here continues into chapter two. So in verse 23, it says, being born again. Now, Peter spoke of this in chapter 1 and verse 3 when he says, uh, we are begotten. Uh, this is talking about your birth. So Peter's talking about our birth. Now, at your birth, at your birth, you're born with an identity. Now, our culture wants to deny that or say that we can change our identity, but at your birth, you're given an identity. It's sacred. That's why birth is sacred. That's why, um, that, that, that's why we believe and Christians understand that someone's uh, background, someone's ethnic makeup, it's sacred. That's why uh, to a Christian, the color of one's skin makes no difference. That's why a Christian uh, doesn't treat someone differently because of where they were born or to which parents they were born or the color of their skin, their people group. Uh, why? Because that's sacred. It's given by God. That's an identity given by God. And we, we recognize that as sacred. That's why Christians are so careful about the gender issues of our day. We are loving and, and uh, uh, desire to be helpful to those who are struggling with that. We're not unkind uh, toward them, uh, but we believe that our gender is sacred, given to us by God as part of our identity. And so here is Peter talking about being born again, our, our birth and our identity. So when you were born, God gave you part of your identity. What's part of your identity? It's your gender, 
Uh, it's your family, you know, your family name. Uh, it's your location. Uh, birth certificates are important. Tells you who your father is, who your mother is, where you were born. Uh, that's uh, your nationality and your location. Uh, I was reminded of this recently. Uh, our grandson Pierce, uh, Chris and Kristen's uh, son, was born um, in an ambulance in Manhattan. Uh, at uh, Amsterdam and, and 84th Street. Uh, that is literally the location on the birth certificate. There's a lot that it, that, that tells us about Pierce and his identity. It says uh, the location where he was born. It tells us that he was born uh, to uh, parents here in America. It tells uh, you know his parents' name, who they are, his gender, his weight. It's all about his identity and so it's it so it's it's certainly natural when um when um the bible talks about being born again or being begotten or being um uh you, you know but born again the fact is that <clears throat> this speaks of our identity and uh so the analogy of rebirth in the Word of God for those who put their faith in Christ is vital and it's important. It speaks of a new identity. It speaks of a new citizenship. All of that is tied to our birth and our birth certificates. Um, uh, and so uh, it, it speaks of a new father. It speaks of a new family. Uh, church, brothers and sisters in Christ. All those are terms that are used. Those aren't haphazard. Those aren't casual terms. Those all are terms that speak of our identity and our new identity in Christ. And so Peter says, love should define our relationship with other Christians. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And so our love to one another, especially the Bible says those of the household of faith, this family. We oftentimes refer to our church as the church family. Those members are the church family. It's the fam We talk about the family of God. And so um, love should define our relationship with other Christians. Uh, in the next couple of weeks, we'll look at um, the fact that our love should de uh, to be defined, or, or we should be defined by our love to those outside of the household of faith too, and outside of the church. Uh, Peter doesn't leave that out, but right now he's saying, listen, um, you're scattered, don't forget to love. Just because you're suffering, don't lose your love. Don't mistreat, don't forget who you are. Don't forget who your family is. And so, love one another in verse 22. And um, then um, Peter speaks in verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. So this new birth has everything to do with the word of God. And as a matter of fact, in chapter two, he gets back into that. Look at verse Two, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. And so our love for one another is in direct relationship to our relationship to God's word. Um, we can't just leave out God's word and expect that we're going to love God the way that we should and love our neighbor as ourself. No, it's God's word that works in us through God's grace to produce that love in us and so our relationship with the word of god is vital so peter's saying you're suffering you're scattered but don't forget your family you're members of the same family so love one another uh, in uh, he speaks of the milk of the word he says desire it uh, like a baby desires the nutrition they need boy a baby isn't going to go without nutrition very long if they do they're going to remind you of it. They're going to cry. They're going to cry loudly. They're going to get your attention. Why? Because they have to have that nutrition. And Peter says, desire, just like a baby needing milk, desire that sincere milk of the word. Uh, a baby desires milk. Why? 
Why do they cry? It's not because, oh, there's something wrong with that baby. No, they're, that's God's way of, of uh, uh, letting us know as, as adults that, boy, that baby needs something. They can't talk. They can't tell us, hey, I, you know, I'm hungry. They have to, they, they cry. Uh, and they tell us that, uh, that God's given us this, given them this natural instinct. And so um, the birth is the beginning physically and a new birth is the beginning spiritually of these desires. And God's word contains the nutrients that we need to grow. Let me just challenge you in that area. Be in God's word. Get good Christian music and listen to the word in song. Be in the Word of God. Maybe it's podcasts that you can listen to that will remind you of His truths. Maybe it's messages. But whatever you do, certainly reading God's Word. Make God's Word a vital part of your life. It's part of being, uh, it's part of the spiritual rebirth. Just like eating is part of the physical birth. And so Peter is reminding these Christians of that. And uh, how we are commanded uh, to love one another here by Peter. Uh, love one another is the command. It says in verse 22, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. Loving isn't uh, a, lo loving isn't just something we say, well, I, I think I'll love that person. No, we're commanded to love that person. Uh, you can't say, I'm just not a loving person. And so I'll just dismiss that. No, it's God's, it's God's grace that changes us and makes us into a loving person. It's a command. It's not just, hey, if you think about it, if you'd like to love that person. Yeah, oh, they're not very loving. Doesn't matter. We're commanded to love them. Uh, and, and, um, and so Peter uh, is certainly hitting the nail on the head with some of his readers who are saying, oh, I'm suffering and I, yeah, I've forgotten that. I'm not loving the way that I should. And he's certainly hitting the nail on the head of our lives. Can I just share my heart uh, with you? As a pastor, I'm, I'm disgusted by the thought of racism in our culture today. Uh, hatred, is not new to our society. I've got to say that too. Hatred started with the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. Um, shortly after the fall, we have a brother, Cain, slaying his, his brother Abel. Hatred started with the fall of man. And uh, the hatred that we see because of the color of one's skin is so repulsive and ought to be repulsive to the Christian. Uh, it's direct, in direct contradiction to the way God commands us to live and empowers us to live. And so God's love in our lives enables us to love one another. What are the, what's the first and great commandment? Love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. The second is likened to it, love your neighbor as yourself. If we don't love God the way that we should, we can't love our neighbor as we uh, do. So the, the solution to the hatred that we see in so many uh, parts of our society and culture today is I'm, I need to get my heart uh, to love God and get right with God and love God and then this takes care of itself. Praise the Lord for that, how he transforms us because love is cheapened in our day. It's Love isn't a warm feeling or a hug. Love is not a kind word or a cup of coffee together, although it might involve that. It's, it's deeper than that. Um, someone said love involves righteous relationships with each other that are based on God's character, which Christian behavior reflects. We live righteously toward one another. It has depth and dimensions and layers beyond a handshake or a hug or making someone feel temporarily happy. Now, I understand a handshake and a hug in this day of coronavirus might not be desirable and we may not even express our love at this point in that manner. But love runs deep. It's an unfeigned love. 
And what does it look like? Peter doesn't leave that to our imagination. Notice what he says. What does that love look like? Chapter 2, verse 1. It continues, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. That's what that love looks like. Malice, love lays that aside. Guile, love lays that aside. Hi hi hypocrisies, well, here's how I expect of you and I don't even examine my own life to determine am I living that way? Malice, guile, hypocrisies, envies. I'm, I see what you have. I see the circumstances in your life. I see your possessions and I want those and I wish you didn't have them. I want those for myself. Envies, evil speakings, uh, talking about one another, gossip, love lays all that aside. That's an unfeigned love, not just lip surface, not just something on the surface, but an unfeigned, deep, abiding love uh, that, that uh, Peter talks about here. Can you imagine now two scattered Christians who may have resentment in their heart for those who are responsible for them being scattered? For those who are blaming them for the problems in the Roman Empire? For those who are saying, I'm not going to hire you because of your Christian beliefs. Now Peter says, hey, have an unfeigned love. First of all, toward one another, toward your brothers and sisters in Christ. This is a love that runs deep. Now, sadly, when Christians face hardship, and I'm 55, and I've seen this in my lifetime, in my 55 years, as long as I can remember, uh, when Christians face hardships, they can often misdirect their anger and fear toward those that we are called to love. Something doesn't go right, something doesn't go according to our plan, and we have, uh, we, we lose our love, we withdraw our love from those that we are commanded to love. It's friendly fire. Friend, we have a world out there to love. We have a world to love to Christ. Why do we spend so much of our time fighting one another? Why do we spend so much time with a lack of love, with, with malice and anger toward our brothers and sisters in Christ? Why is it that we can allow the, the, our background, our fleshly desires, our desires, our wants, our wishes to cause us to treat one another with disrespect and with um, a lack of kindness, a lack of love. Peter said, no, I don't care what suffering you're going through. You're commanded to love one another. And so I want to encourage you this week. Would you demonstrate your love toward another believer? Um, do it with layers and dimension that are beyond just the surface, just the temporarily making them happy. And I want to encourage you, if you're married, if you have a family, start with your spouse, start with your children, and let it go out from there to brother and sister in Christ. I'm not leaving out the lost world, those that are unsaved. Peter later talks about that, but he begins with loving one another with an unfeigned love and uh, demonstrate your love with righteous conduct toward one another. Here's what Peter calls this in verse 20 through 22. He calls it obeying the truth. Now there are two other things that Peter shares with us, but I'm going to reserve those for next week. He says, um, I, I want you to love one another. And he uses three analogies. He says, your family. We are a family. Next week, we're going to see he talks about a building and he talks about a nation. He gets, these are strong words, strong analogies that he uses to demonstrate the love that we should have one for another. But let's just pause here for this morning 
And um, let's look at verse 10 again. Um, in, in verse 10, we see these uh, characteristics of uh, being a Christian. Um, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come uh, unto you. Let me go to uh, verse 10 of uh, chapter 2. Uh, it says, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Peter said, you got to love one another the way you should. And he uses family, building, and nation. And he says, it wasn't always like that in your, in your life. But this salvation that was spoken of way back by the prophets now results in your life as, notice how he describes us, we're not a people, but are now the people of God and have now obtained mercy. Nothing proud in that at all. We're not, we don't save ourselves. We're not, we don't obtain mercy because of the fact that we deserve it. We're good people, we're special people, we're better than those out there. No, we have obtained a mercy. And so that word mercy um, says, it's the discre according to Webster's, it's the discretionary power of a judge to pardon someone or to mitigate punishment. The discretionary power of a judge to pardon someone or to mitigate punishment. Peter's already talked about the fact that we have a judge. He's our father, but he's also our judge, and we'll give an account to him one day. And so the characteristics of a Christian, it's not a feeling of moral superiority. <laughs> we're better than them out there. Uh, it's not a feeling of judging others because we're better than them. Uh, that's why we're commanded not to judge one another. Uh, it's not a feeling of entitlement that says, hey, I deserve heaven and I deserve God's favor because he loves me more uh, than some others because of what I do for him. I'm sort of the cream of the crop. I'm the guy that uh, God loves because look at what I do for him. John said, here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. We can't look at love and say, hey, look how I'm loving you, God. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. And so a thousand times, no, that's not the characteristic of a Christian, the important characteristic of a Christian, of a believer, we've obtained mercy. How does that happen? Well, Paul said in Galatians 3, no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. You're not justified because you live the law. You keep the commandments. You live a good life. It's evident. Paul said it's obvious the just shall live by faith. Then Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. That simply means, think of it this way, the substitutionary life of Jesus. He lived a righteous life. He perfectly fulfilled the law in your place when you put your faith in Him. You get the credit for having lived all of the law. He fulfilled all of the law perfectly. The, and, and then that propitiation also speaks of His substitutionary death, the fact that, that He paid the penalty for our sins. To declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, and then listen to this, we close with this, that he might be just, certainly he is just, he never sinned, Jesus never sinned, he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. He is just, never sinned, and he's a justifier of them which believe in Jesus Christ. And so, my friend, you become justified by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you to do that today. And uh, just place your faith in Christ. Simply pray, Father, I realize that I'm not just, that I have sinned. I believe what the Bible says, that there's a penalty for my sin 
that um, uh, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and that includes me. And then that, um, that uh, I put my faith in you, and I can only be righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ, faith in Christ Jesus. And so I need to be justified. And so, Father, again, just pray something like this. I'm not just. I need you. You are the one who justifies. I can't justify myself. I put my faith in you. And, uh, uh, and, and I realize that the only way I can have forgiveness of sin, a relationship reconciled to God, a hope for, of heaven for all of eternity is by putting my faith in you. Simply pray that. And if you have, feel, feel free to let us know. We'd love to rejoice with you and help you in your journey. Email us at info at internationalbaptistny.org and let us know you put your faith in Christ. And we'd like to encourage you in your walk with the Lord. And if you're saved, rejoice in the fact that he has equipped us to love one another and don't lose your love when you're suffering. Father, thank you for this time this morning in your word. We pray that you would help us to be encouraged by your word. May we in our city that uh, has been through a difficult time in the last three months, may we be the children of light in a really dark time. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Show.